there, you will see a question and answers box. So if you have any questions throughout the presentations, please just pop your question into the box. Um, we ask that you do pop it in the questions and answers box and not the chat box, because then everyone can see all your personal information. So this is just to retain confidentiality. Uh, you'll also see in the chat box um, a link to the donation page for As I Am. If anyone wants to donate to As I Am, we would really appreciate any support you could give us this evening. Uh, also, just a reminder to everyone that this webinar will be recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube page for tomorrow to share with anyone who could not be here tonight. So now I'm just going to pass you over to our first speaker, Maya. So thanks again for joining us tonight, Maya. Thank you so much, Nicola. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my name is Maya. I'm, I'm an autistic psychologist from Denmark. And yeah, so I, I was asked to speak about autism and relationships and the first thing to, to really note is that these are two very big topics um, and they're complex topics. So I won't be able to cover everything in 40, 45 minutes. There's just no way. Um, but I'm going to try my best to just cover the main bases and, and give some general um, information and perspective. Um, not everyone will agree with everything I say tonight. That's OK. <laughs> um, so yeah. Let's just get started. Um, the first thing that I really want to talk about is the spectrums of sex, gender, gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Um, and this is because these are all very, very much spectrums. And of course, the first thing that pops into people's minds is, well, biological sex, that's binary. We all know that, but it's actually not. Um, we're taught in school that sex is binary, um, male, female, um, but this is not actually true. Um, the details are quite a lot to go into. So this is just to say that it's not, um, even in terms of chromosomes and um, hormones, uh, there's quite a lot of differences. It's possible to have more chromosomes than just XX and XY. It's, for example, possible to have three chromosomal expressions. So it's quite a lot. Moving on from that, we have gender, where we've got gender expression and gender identity, which um, we talk about them in terms of um, femininity and masculinity. Um, those are the words we've got right now to talk about that. Um, but the thing is that gender expression and gender identity don't necessarily have to follow along with each other. Um, so you can be a very androgynously expressed person, but identify fully as female or male, or you can be someone who is expressed in a very masculine way, for example, but you're actually gender fluid. Um, so these are all spectrums where we all sort of move on our own terms. Um, you don't have to know your own gender expression or your own gender identity. You don't have to know how to talk about that or express that at any particular stage in your life. This is something you explore throughout your life and you know you figure out who you are and that's okay. Um, then there's sexual orientation, which is, um, it's about who you're attracted to romantically and sexually. Um, and again, this can just go in every sort of direction and that's okay too. Um, it's important when we're talking about autism and relationships and sexuality to talk about these things because there is a higher proportion of the autistic population that is not cisgender, um, meaning that they do not identify as the gender they were assigned at birth um, and who are not heterosexual. Um, there's just a lot of diversity in the autistic population. So we do need to talk about these things in autism. Um, one site that I find very useful is it's pronounced metrosexual.com. Um, I personally find that site quite good and it's been recommended to me by um, colleagues and other autistic people. So that's one place to go for information. Um, now, when we talk about autism and relationships, we have to talk about emotions and interoception. Um, so first of all, what is interoception? And I'm just gonna go very quickly here because again, we don't have a lot of time. Interoception is something to do with 
knowing what is going on in your body, knowing where your body is, how it's feeling, and knowing what's going on inside of you, really. Um, and this can be difficult for autistic people. Um, and I'm going to go a bit more into that in terms of emotions, but know that that this applies actually to a lot of things, not just emotions. But let's get into emotions as well, because gosh, um, so why are emotions so confusing? Well, if you talk about uh, emotions in terms of being on a thermometer uh, from, from zero to 10, and uh, zero is neutral, 10 is quite a lot, um, quite extreme, then autistic people tend to be better at identifying and talking about emotions that are at zero to three and eight to 10. Um, and then for some people, it can be very hard to even notice that there's anything in between. And for others, it just feels like it goes really fast. So it may be that you are actually slowly going from three to four to five to six onwards, but you don't notice it until you hit eight. And then suddenly it's like very overwhelming. Um, and for the autistic person, even it can be very confusing and talking about and getting to know and expressing those emotions in between. Um, it's a journey and really a lot of it has to do with learning a lot of different words about different forms of emotions, different uh, types of sadness, um, happiness, anger, all these things. Um, which brings us to alexithymia, which is a thing that a lot of a lot of autistic people deal with, which is kind of an, an impairment or a difficulty with um, identifying and finding the words to express an emotion that you're having. Um, so this, this is kind of a big thing. And I can almost hear someone sitting there going, what's this got to do with, with relationships? Well, it's got everything to do with relationships because relationships is very much about reading your partner's emotions and communicating with your partner about your own and their emotions. Um, so it's really important actually that we make an effort to learning how to communicate about emotions, learning how to reflect on our own emotions, talking about them and learning the nuances. Um, also learning, for example, that you can have several emotions at the same time. This is something that um, uh, and an adult, uh, an autistic adult that I've spoken to recently said, you know, I was in my 20s before I knew that I could have two conflicting emotions at the same time until a psychologist explained it to me. And then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, that's what's going on. Um, so even just things like that can be really important to talk about. Um, so let's move on now to talking about the expectations of what is a relationship even. Um, this is a big topic for me because in media, we are shown a lot of narratives about relationships, but media, movies, TV series, music, they often present, you know, flirtation and courtship, but they don't really portray long-term relationships. So very often, if you're watching a movie, getting the girl or getting the guy is like, the goal of the whole movie. And then the movie ends after the kiss or after the wedding, and you don't get to see what happens after that. So you're not actually getting a very good impression of what is a relationship even. Um, on top of that, uh, there's a lot of social media going about, right? And people curate uh, the portrayal of their relationship online um, and in public as well. And often what they'll do is they'll try to make it look perfect. Um, they will post clips of, of, of photos of their dates, uh, cute little things that their partner does for them, all these things. They'll, they'll try to make it look a certain way, but they're not posting pictures of everyday life. So we don't get to see that. And in society, in our society, we have very much um, a narrative um, a way of talking about relationships as though they are kind of the path to acceptance or to happiness, that it's, this is the thing you need in your life. And I think this is an important thing to talk about with autistic people because 
you can have very low social needs or very low social capacity. And if that is you, then being in a relationship in the way that society portrays relationships should be, that might not actually be the thing for you. For example, you might not um, cope quite as well with moving in together with your partner, even though this is the thing you are supposed to do. Um, because it's quite stressful to live with someone if your social capacity is very low. Um, there will be other things about living together that can be beneficial, but these are certainly things that we do need to consider as autistic people in terms of what are we actually looking for in a relationship, what's actually good for us in a relationship and what is not. Um, so just an example. Um, Another thing with, with the expectations of relationships is that people act differently once the first few months are over. The first um, honeymoon phase when the, the initial rush of, of sort of being in love fades a little bit, people start acting um, differently and the emotions sort of fall into place. This doesn't mean you don't love each other anymore. It just means that you've moved on to the, the stable part of the relationship and you're actually, what's actually happening is that all of those um, love hormones in your brain have calmed down and you've now returned to sanity. So that's not a bad thing, you know? It, this doesn't mean that you, this is not the passionate, loving relationship that you wanted. It just means that now you're going into a different phase of it. Um, and that's actually very important because in relationships, in long-term relationships, Daily life can be very boring because it's daily life. Not every day is, you know, an exciting new thing. And that can be difficult to come to terms with if your idea of a relationship is what you're being shown in the movies. Um, because, of course, the movies do tend to focus on the passion and the excitement and um, all of those things. Right. So relationships are very much give and take. Um, and, and people do also like to say that, but it's important that it's not a calculation. It has to be what works for you, what works for you and your partner. And in terms of that, I find that people really get a lot from considering what is it I actually want from a relationship and what do I bring to the table? Um, and again, this is not a calculation this is self-reflection. This is getting to know who you are and what you need. And now we get to the comment that I get very often um, from autistic people, which is, I hear you say all these things, but how do I even get into a relationship in the first place? And I hate that question. It, it's my least favorite question ever because the honest answer is I can't tell you. Um, there, is, there is no recipe to give. Uh, people are different and they respond differently to things and they should. Um, so the only things that I can really say in terms of how do I get into a relationship is very, very general things. It's like, well, focus on just things about you that are a good that make you a good person, you know, focus on, on empathy, kindness, um, you know, being nice to other people. Um, but it's also very much about be you, be, be the best you, but be you. Um, don't try to become someone else. Don't try to change yourself into someone else's expectations or your perception of someone else's expectations. Um, it, it's really much, it, it's really a lot about, you know, Yes, be the best you, but do it for yourself. Don't, don't do it for someone else and don't do it for a relationship. That's not going to be good for you in the long run. Um, in terms of meeting people, well, great. Um, meeting people with similar interests will more often lead to friendships and relationships. Um, and I say friendships and relationships because friendships happen much more often than relationships do. And friendships are great. Um, and there's this narrative in our, in our society about the friend zone and how that's a punishment from people. 
Um, but the friend zone, we could have a long discussion about if that's even a thing really, but let's just assume it is and talk about it as, as if it is. The friend zone isn't a bad place to be. You've still made a great friend. Um, so, you know, be happy about the friendship that you've got. Um, and gosh, don't become someone's friend or pretend to become someone's friend because you're only looking for a sexual or romantic relationship. That's not a nice thing to do. And when they find out that that's what you've done, they're going to become really, really hurt. Um, you know, it's manipulative. So, you know, be honest about your intentions. Um, be honest about what it is you want. And also be open to the fact that friendship is a really, really good thing. Um, the fact is that you can't make someone like you. Um, you they can, of course, start to like you, um, but that's something that happens within them. It's not something you can force to happen. Um, and it's honestly very important to recognize that no matter what you've done for someone, you are never owed intimacy from someone else. And this leads us to talking about consent. And when we talk about consent, I really want to start with a pet peeve of mine, which is teaching consent to children. Um, because very often when we have to do with children, we forget their bodily autonomy. And we end up, uh, you know, saying to our kids, oh, go hug your aunt goodbye, or um, don't you want to hug granddaddy? You know, all these things. But the thing is, when you're making your child hug or kiss a family member and they don't want to, you're teaching them that their bodily autonomy does not matter. And that's bad because then they grow up not having that knowledge that their consent and their bodily autonomy matters and that they are allowed to say no and that they should say no when they feel the desire to say no. <laughs> um, so this is very much a pet peeve of mine. D do, do take that and spread it out into the world. Don't make children um, give physical intimacy to people when they don't want to. It's, it's not great. Um, in terms of consent, there are so many good sources online. One of my favorite sources is a very short clip, um, which is available on YouTube. It's called Tea and Consent. Um, and, and I think a lot of people know about this clip, but it's just magnificent. Now, I want to make sure that I do tell you that there are two versions. One of them has clean language, the other does not. So the clean version is posted by Thames Valley Police. That is the clean version no swear words. Um, then there is a version by um, Blue Seat Studios, which seems to be the original, but it does not have clean language. So just be aware of that when you're looking for it. Um, another thing that I want to say about consent, which is very important, is that consent is not permission. It's much more than permission. Um, consent is something that is freely given and that is revocable, meaning you can take it back whenever you want. And it is informed, meaning that you know what you are consenting to. These are very, very important. Consent is not saying, oh, okay, fine, let's do it. That's not consent. So we've covered that. Um, now let's move on to talking about consent in a relationship. Um, because this is not something you stop talking about when you enter into a relationship. It's, it's very much something you continue to do. Um, you are never owed anything and you don't owe them anything. That's a very important point. You are always allowed to say no, even if you've done this before, even if you've liked it before, you can always say no and you do not need a reason. This is important. Your partner also does not need a reason and they can always say no, even if they've done it before, even if they liked it before. That's just how it is. Now, what you can do is ask, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? Um, would you like it if I did that? Um, 
And this is something where not just to do with relationships, but also to do with with um, just a very new sort of relationship with with flirting, with courtship, with all of these things. I hear, and I've heard it mostly from men, and I apologize if that is um, is a stereotype, but I have heard it mostly from men that, oh, but it ruins the mood to ask like that. And I have to bring this up because I talk to a lot of my friends and women talk. And let me tell you, please, if you have ever had the thought that asking for consent will ruin the mood, I have only ever heard women rave about men they have met that asked for consent and that were express in what they wanted and how they wanted it and were ready to hear the word no and ready to hear the word yes. Women are very, very happy to be asked. People are very happy to be asked what they want to do. So please, no, it does not ruin the mood. People like being asked for consent. Yes, we've covered that. <laughs> Another pet peeve of mine. Um, so communication, which of course consent is very much a part of, is the cornerstone of any kind of relationship. And of course, communication is very much listening and it's very much sharing, talking about um, you know, one's needs. It's about your emotional needs. It's about your support needs. It's about any other personal needs that you have and expectations about the relationship, about daily life, all of these things. Um, and it's also communicating about communicating, which is, gosh, kind of wrapped up. But when it comes to, for example, a conflict or a miscommunication, um, it's very important to be able to talk to your partner about, you know, how can we become better at talking about this next time? How can we be better at communicating about this so that it does not become a conflict or so that we do not miscommunicate next time? So learning to communicate is very, very hard. It's something that you keep learning throughout the relationship. It's one of those things, again, that you do not have to know how to do it already. You learn how to, and you have to be willing to learn how to. Um, and it pays off. Um, now, in terms of communication, compromising, which is hard. Um, it's about your personal boundaries. It's about your personal expectations. And it is, it's about communication, honestly. Um, honestly, compromising is something that happens all the time. Um, it, it's not just the big things that are compromises. Compromises can be small, everyday things that you don't even really notice that much. It's, oh, you know, I had this plan to do this, but then my partner wanted to do this instead. And that's, that's important right now to them. So I'm going to do that instead, even though I had planned to do the other thing. That's a compromise. You know, it doesn't have to be something that makes anyone upset. Um, however, some things do. And I want to make sure that we talk about personal deal breakers. Everybody has them. And it's hard to say what is and is not a deal breaker because again, they're personal, they're individual. Everyone has their own things that, that will be their deal breaker in a relationship. This is to say that there are many, many things that you can compromise on, but there's also some things that you can't. And that's okay. Um, so when you do get to a place where there's a personal deal breaker on, on the line, you know, go with, go with who you are, go with your boundaries. It's very important that you listen to yourself. Um, now, compromising is something that works best when you already know your needs or your expectations, but they also come along when you find out what those needs and expectations are. This is really one of those things where, you know, self-reflection and interoception can be very, very important in terms of communicating and compromising with your partner. Um, it's also something that really works best when your communication is calm and respectful. Even if you're upset, you know, it's very important to try to regulate those emotions 
and to talk calmly and respectfully with your partner because that's usually what gets the best results for everyone. So, yeah. Um, and the thing is, once you stop being calm and respectful, that's when it very much stops just being a compromise and becomes a conflict. And conflicts happen in every relationship. It's not something that you can avoid. Um, and it does not mean that you have to break up. <laughs> um, that's very important because even if you're very, very upset, even if you think I can't handle this anymore right now, it's just, it's just horrible. It's over. I can't, I can't do this. Um, it is very, very important to recognize that emotion is going to calm down and you're going to have time to think about why you were hurt, how you can talk about what happened, how you can move on from what happened later in 30 minutes, in two hours, or tomorrow. So, you know, you don't have to have a really big conflict because you're being upset right now. Regulate, get through the conflict as respectfully as you can. Don't take your negative emotions out on your partner if you can avoid it, um, and apologize if you do. Um, and, and deal with that conflict at a later time. Um, because you know, conflicts, it's about coping and dealing with really difficult emotions and talking about them. Um, that comes as well when, when it's just a bad day, for example. One thing that I found in my, my relationship, which is um, 15 years now, is that um, it's so important to just talk about, I'm having a bad day. Um, it's nothing to do with you. I'm really sorry if I snap at you, but I'm just, things are just crappy today and I don't know why and I need some more alone time today than I usually do. You know, you've communicated right there to your partner, this is what's going on. Either, you know, what does it come from or I don't know what it comes from, but it's not you. So they know okay, so it's not something I have to do something about. And you've communicated, okay, you need alone time. So what to do about it? Um, you know, commuting, communicating those things about what's going on, what do you need? Those are things that, that really help in the long run. Um, and that also help to tell your partner, you know, it's not their fault necessarily that you're just having a bad day. Everybody has bad days sometimes. Um, but it's important to tell them that because otherwise they might think that it's their fault and then it becomes a conflict that you are having a bad day and it doesn't have to be. Um, now, conflicts really arise when expectations are not matched. Um, so when boundaries are crossed or established, um, when there are surprises or changes that, that trigger sort of personal reactions. Um, so this can just be something like, suddenly um, X family member has invited us to a birthday party in two days and that's just not enough time for me to handle this. So now there's a huge conflict and it actually involves the entire family now because it, I didn't have enough time to, to deal with this change in my calendar. Those things can, can trigger conflicts and can also trigger some really negative emotions. And that's where you use your partner to actually talk about what's going on, how do we handle it, how do we handle the emotions that are involved, and how do we move on from that? Yeah, communication, communication, communication. <laughs> um, one really thing, really important thing about conflicts and bad days is that apologizing is not a failure. Apologizing is really, really important and good. And it helps strengthen your relationship when you are able to apologize when you've done something that was not great. Um, another thing uh, is to forgive your partner for not being perfect. Um, you're not perfect either. So, you know, forgive your partner for also being human. Um, but this, this goes actually further than you even might think from me just saying that. One thing that that has been really important to me and that I also hear from other people um, in my life who are in long-term relationships is 
how important it is to give your partner props for trying, not just for succeeding. Um, so for example, when you enter into a relationship as an autistic person, you know, as autistic people, we have meltdowns or shutdowns sometimes. Um, we can't avoid all of them. And even if we try our best, sometimes they happen. Your partner, whether they are autistic or realistic, they may not know how to handle your meltdown or shutdown, and they need to learn to. So you communicate about how to handle that. What do you want from them when that happens? And then it's a learning process for them. But it's very much helpful for them when you then, once you are out of your meltdown or shutdown, to recognize you actually tried to do the thing that we talked about that I need you to do. You tried your best to handle this situation and I appreciate that. So it's about giving your partner props for trying, not just for succeeding. And that of course goes the other way around as well. They should be giving you props for, for doing your best as well. Um, now with autism specifically in relationships, all of the autism specific um, traits and symptoms and all of that come into play. So my relationship, there's a lot of talking about social batteries and space, personal space. So boundaries, for example, with um, knocking on each other's door, if we are in separate rooms and the door is shut, that's very important because as an autistic person, if I'm in my bubble and you just enter the room, that's going to be a huge violation for me. Um, that doesn't go for every autistic person, of course, it's just an example, but it's really about communicating about your needs for space and how is your social battery doing? Uh, what do you need? It's about your sensory issues as well, not just communicating about what they are, but how to handle them, uh, what to do when I start to get sensory overload, all of these things, meltdown, shutdowns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, what I find um, with stimming is that that's a very useful tool, uh, but it's also something that it took me a while to be comfortable doing in front of other people. And so that can be a thing to talk to your partner about is, you know, I have these stims, I may or may not be comfortable using them in front of you, but sometimes I really need to use that tool to calm myself down. So I may need to actually go into a different room to be alone, to stim, <laughs> to be away and, and be on my own to do that. Or if I'm doing it in front of you, don't make fun of it. <laughs> do not make fun of it, <laughs> um, definitely. Um, and, and for me, honestly, that would be a personal deal breaker. Um, it might not be for everyone. And there are people that need to learn not to make fun of those things, but it's, for me, that would be a deal breaker. Um, so yeah, really just when we're talking about autism and relationships, the main factors is that relationships are very much about communicating um, and sharing and very much in terms of what are my stresses? How do we avoid them as much as possible? What are your stresses? How do we avoid them as much as possible? Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you're moving in together um, with your partner as an autistic person, that can be a huge change versus independent living. Um, and it can be positive and negative. Um, so these are things where as an autistic person, you may want to have a, more of a trial period in terms of um, trying to see what's it like to live together. Can I really handle it before you give up your independent accommodations? Um, if that is at all possible for you. So there are things like that that we really need to um, keep in mind. Now, the last thing that I really, really do need to say, and this may anger people, but hear me out. Your autistic needs are not more important than your partner's. They are equally as important. 
And this is something that can be very difficult for some people to hear because as autistic people, our needs can be very specific and they can be very much apart from the norm. However, they are not more important than your partner's needs. Your partner's needs are just as specific. They're just perhaps not vocalized in the same way because they're not used to having to talk about them in that way. Um, but they are important. And if both partners' needs are not met, then the relationship is going to suffer. So that is the final takeaway that I would like to leave you with in terms of this very, very big topic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. That was great. You, you did well uh, putting it all together there. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> Uh, Kevin, we'll pass over to you now. Um, oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Maya. That was fantastic. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin McLaughlin. Uh, I'm a 21-year-old uh, autistic man from uh, County Clare, and uh, I'm really glad to be here speaking this evening as somebody I'm speaking more so on the personal experience side rather than the uh, professional side, but that's the wonderful thing about Maya is you get a bit of both mixed in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, this is actually my fourth talk on this topic, so hopefully I won't go over like I did in all other three. Um, so um, I suppose the thing that I want to start with is that um, me, myself, being a young man on the spectrum. Uh, I have throughout my life found some things more difficult than other people my age. And I just want to point out for context for the rest of my talk, from my own viewpoint, people on the spectrum are simply with those with different non-neurotypical, non-conforming perspectives of the world. I don't particularly like the word disability. Um, uh, I don't think anyone else can fully understand the crazy connections that we often make in our heads between the smallest of sensory inputs and the largest of emotions. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, you know, people make the effort and that's kind of something that I want to uh, touch on later. Um, it's often misunderstood when I say that I'm autistic because people will often ask me, um, people often find it, <laughs> Uh, doubtful. Um, an awful lot of people find it doubtful. They're like, you are doing a university degree and you are um, well-spoken and in many leadership roles and you started a society in college and you started clubs when you were in secondary school. Um, to which I like to remind people that uh, autism is a very diverse spectrum um, and not in the least when it, uh, like, like, not, it like absolutely so diverse when it comes to the uh, rom romantic and sexual expression of autistic individuals. Um, as uh, Maya pointed out before, um, there is a tendency in the uh, autism community to be somehow way, way above the standard population's level of, uh, uh, of um, divergent sexualities uh, and um, identities from the norm, be it gender identities, romantic identities, uh, different kinds of sexualities. I myself am a bisexual, um, uh, well, bi-demisexual. Um, so in my case, that means I have to have a connection with somebody in order to uh, feel attraction to them. Um, and here is something that I always want to get off right off the bat is if you uh, have a young autistic child or something and you don't really know much about the LGBT community, um, you can only do yourself favors by learning a little bit at this stage <laughs> because whether it's their friends or them, it'll come up at some stage <laughs> um, and uh, understanding it can often uh, make a massive difference in how uh, your child develops, for example, my parents being understanding of my bisexuality and of my demisexuality uh, was an extremely liberating experience. I've had friends who are autistic whose parents have had the opposite reaction and that 
seems to have a crazy more significant um, impact on an autistic person's development than a neurotypical person's development uh, in my experience from speaking from my friends, etc. So um, when people hear the word, uh, hear like the phrase, um, like uh, autistic person in a relationship, when they hear that, they often think of Sheldon Cooper and Amy Fairfowler from The Big Bang Theory. If people don't know, that's um, a horrifically stereotyped, badly done, badly written relationship that is supposed to be between uh, an autistic individual and somebody who is presented as maybe, maybe also being autistic, but in a different way, um, which is one of those things that uh, Hollywood has thrown at us as like, look, all of these people can have relationships as well. We're going to make them very awkward and the butt of every joke, but, you know, uh, they can as well. Um, and I like to point out that that is not how it works. Um, it, it is for some, maybe, like, like, like maybe some people are that exact stereotype portrayal. Maybe there's one or two, perhaps. I um, I don't think that there really are, um, but per, you know uh, maybe somewhere out there there is the perfect stereotype. Um, but uh, I think what I like to point to people is that uh, I am twenty one. I have been in significant long term relationships for the last six years of my life, um, which freaks people out when they find out that I'm autistic and that I have had successful and healthy relationships as an adult, <laughs> you know, um, so uh, the assumption seems to be that um, people have massively delayed uh, sexual and romantic like development for some reason. Um, that seems to be like the assumption amongst media uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to autistic people. But what I have found from me, my friends, anyone I've worked with with autism, um, that can be the case. Some people do have delayed, like, like so do some people without autism. Um, you have people like me who maybe have some, uh, what I would call advanced, uh, you know, I started dating when I was 15 years old, like an awful lot of people do. <laughs> um, you know, that's, the, the, that's just like a thing is that it's a spectrum and, because it's a spectrum, all of these other spectrums in life all feed into it. You have like everything, and here's a spoiler, everything in life is a spectrum. <laughs> everything is between like, you, you know, everything's on a color wheel and uh, everyone fits somewhere on a different color wheel, a, a different place on different color wheels. So say for example, myself, um, I may be uh, autistic. I also am not a math mathematical genius. Um, I, I happen to be into arts and crafts and theater. Um, you know, um, I also happen to, um, to, to like leadership roles and taking an active, uh, like participation in my communities. Um, so why is it that we're so embarrassed about talking about the autistic positions on the sexual and attraction spectrums? I actually have three questions, three quick polls um, that I'm going to ask uh, to put up uh, now. Um, please answer as well as you can. Um, uh, I'll give everyone uh, 30 seconds per question, we'll say. Answer as well as you can. Okay, so I'm going to trust that people have finished the first one and we can go on to the second. And this is, uh, this is more so an exercise for you at home rather than an actual like study or anything. Um, trust me, like the, you're, this isn't going to be used in some paper that I'm writing one day, I promise. Uh, it's just going to be for people to illustrate 
the point that I'm trying to make. Um, okay. Um, just because I'm conscious of how long I have to speak, I'm going to say we'll go on to the next one and we'll finish up uh, the question part quickly. And we'll say five, four, three, two, one. And we'll take that as hopefully people have had the chance to answer. It might have been a bit quick. It's the point is just to get, yeah. So, okay. Have you taken time to talk to them about these kinds of feelings and how to healthily process them? 50% no, 50.9% no, 49.1% yes. Is that, um, and this is for the question and answer, uh, portion more so uh, that uh, we can engage on this. But I find that the answer typically, especially when it comes to parents, is that it's embarrassing, that you don't know where to start. Um, to which the answer is there is no perfect place to start. Um, where, where do you think is the perfect place to start? Is it going to be when uh, they've started doing things and they have no idea what they're doing? Is it going to be before they even have the slightest idea and you put it in their head by accident because you didn't realize? Um, the perfect place to start is different for every individual. Um, in my experience, the perfect place to start was when my parents started to think I may be feeling some of these things. Um, my mother tried to have a conversation with me about it. We talked about romance. That was fine. When it got to sexual stuff, I became uncomfortable. So about Two days later, my father left a book on my bed, uh, an educational book, a note. You can ask me anything, anytime, and I will talk to you in one week. And I will just ask, do you have any questions? Do you understand this? Do you understand consent? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and that was perfect for me <laughs> because I was terrified of talking to my parents about anything to do with sex. Um, <laughs> so uh, I learned from the book. Um, I then asked my father a few questions that I had, uh, some of which he didn't have the answer to because, you know, not everyone can have every answer at the perfect time. Um, and that's the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate for people is you will feel like you're doing it wrong until it's done and you can reflect on it later with those results. And I say that as somebody who has had to take the role of explaining stuff to some of my peers whose parents were not going to do it for them. <laughs> um, you know, um, it's not exactly easy to know whether you're doing the right thing in terms of helping someone in their development at a specific time. Like, 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 like you won't know at first. And I'm sorry to say, and I'm sure that, that scares a lot of people. But at the same time, you can ask questions from people like Maya and me who know a lot about the topic and can maybe be helpful. Um, so I'm gonna move on to uh, another one of my points that um, to protect your child's privacy is one of the most important things you can possibly do when, a, when broaching this topic. Um, if your child does not feel like they can trust you to maintain their confidence and their, uh, uh, like if you poke fun as a joke, like in my family, there has always been a certain level of slagging, of jokes. It's always been a thing that we've done. but knowing when that is appropriate and when it is damaging is one of the most valuable skills a parent of an autistic child can pick up <laughs> because i think that a little bit of slagging is always good a little bit of you know joking around because i think it's always good to a certain extent to build up a little bit of like humor uh, ability to kind of um what? ah <laughs> What's happened? 
Uh, hello? Sorry, am I back? I have no idea what happened there. Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> okay. Oh, no idea what happened there. Um, the thing that I was saying... Um, yeah, sorry. The thing that I was saying just there was that... Um, God, what was I saying? Uh, sorry, that's just broken sorry. my flow a little bit. Hmm? Joking about and slagging. On. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. A little bit of joking, a little bit of slagging um, around certain top uh, around topics, especially even, even topics like this. It can be good. It can build up a sense of humor. It can prepare your child for what the rest of the world is going to do once they're out the door. But knowing the moment that you cannot at all, you cannot at all in certain moments slag or make fun of your child when they are trying to ask you questions or about things like this. When I asked my parents questions about love, consent and relationships, there was no jokes in the house. There was serious, genuine answers because that's what's required. Um, upholding their privacy, not be, like, especially if they have siblings, you know, being discreet, not, you know, announcing it, not doing that really awkward thing a lot of parents do of telling everyone else to leave the room and sitting you down at the table to have a chat. Um, you know, that I find um, often leads to people, people who I know that was the situation have often ended up coming to their friends later for further clarification. And, you know, um, it shouldn't be a stressful situation on either of them. You are just telling your child the facts of the world and your child is just learning from you. That's, that's what's happening. Uh, it's the same as when you teach them that the stove is hot or, you know, that, um, uh, that we don't go wandering off uh, in the middle of the night. It's, 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 it's a fact of life that you're educating your child. And having a wide base of knowledge, informing yourself through resources such as these and others uh, is important because you want to have the answers to as many questions as you can, because if you do, your child will trust more that this is a source of information that I can hold on to. Um, and that brings me into my third point of your child, if you successfully manage to do everything right, your child's gonna make mistakes. They're going to date people that you maybe think aren't the best match. They're probably, you're probably not going to love the person that they lose their virginity to because no parent does. <laughs> um, an autistic child doesn't make it any different in terms of that aspect. Um, but the important thing to remember is that your autistic child may not come straight away understanding that they are heartbroken or that you were right all along and I told you so's are even worse in this instance than in every other instance. What you need is support, a warm, kind, liberating environment from which trust like communication can grow. And if people can learn trust and communication from their parents, from people who are teaching them, then they can have those in their relationships. I I'm not always the best example because I didn't listen to a thing my parents said. Everything I'm saying is the opposite of what I did, um, you know, because uh, I've lived it. So I know <laughs> um, my first relationship was a train wreck. I was not treated the way that I should have been treated. And I thought that because I had sexual attraction to somebody and they showed me affection and it was and, and I did the same, that that was true love. And I was 15 years old and I started dating this guy. And six months later, I didn't tell my parents about the massive heartache or anything. I dealt with it by myself and with my friends, but that's because that was a time when the openness between parents and stuff, um, my parents did everything they could, but uh, I wasn't very good at like listening to that. And they didn't have these kind of resources to help them out with, you know, talking to me about this stuff they like it was more so a time of if you want to read about autism you have to read academic papers rather than someone being able to break it down for an average parent to understand so 
in my case, you don't want that happening to your child. And if it does happen to your child, you want to react in the best way. You want to know that they can come to you. You want to make that clear. My parents did. I'm, again, do, opposite of me. <laughs> That's what you're going for here. Opposite of me. Um, and uh, like I'm very recently now out of a two and a half year long relationship. Last month it ended. Um, not bad at all. Not no arguments, not anything. Um, but that's something I want to get across to show the progression. When I was younger, I didn't feel like I could talk to my parents about like problems in my relationship. I didn't think I gave away much more love than I received. In this relationship, I was more clear about my boundaries, about what I wanted and where this was going. Um, we moved in together for a short period of time, about two and a half months, and that didn't work. So we went, we moved, uh, we, we moved back to our separate places, um, you know, and then there was a period where things were good, but they weren't as good as they had been in the past, you know. We were two years into a into the relationship. There was no more honeymoon, um, and we kind of got to a stage um, that things didn't seem to be working very well. So we did something that I never would have thought of in any relationship previous, largely because my parents and my siblings told me that it was a good idea, and I actually started listening to them because it turns out that they've been around a lot longer than I have, and they have some tricks for this thing called life. It's really fun. Um, <laughs> so uh, my parents suggested that we take a break. We spend one month, not necessarily completely cut off contact from each other, but we back off. We go back to the friendship that our relationship blossomed from. And we found that that didn't work quite either. Like we missed each other. So we went back into our relationship for another four months. At the end of that four months, we said that the break, the different things we've tried, hasn't been working. We still love each other. We still care for each other. But this has run its natural course at this point in time. Perhaps something in the future could happen one day. Perhaps it won't. But we were best friends for seven years before we got together. So why can't we be best friends afterwards? And that's the growth cycle that you want by the time that your kids are reaching my age a little bit older. You want your kids to go from heartbreak and they're terrible um, and uh, when a relationship ends to a mature adult response, which is afforded by their education on your end and your receptiveness to their feelings and their, um, uh, and their experiences and the ability to just make a warm environment from the two, to, to, to make it easy for your kids to trust you to care about you your opinions uh, on uh, on these things and to take genuine advice from someone who might know better um and i think that i may have just run out my time there so thank you for listening <laughs> thanks very much kevin that was great i think we covered a lot of ground between uh, both speakers there so uh, just to say a massive thank you uh, to you both for joining us this evening a uh, big thank you as well to everyone who joined us uh, to listen in to us and um, if you have enjoyed tonight's seminar I'll just mention again that there is a link in the chat box to make a donation to As I Am we'd really appreciate any support you can give at all so um, we will now move on to some questions and answers I did see some coming in there uh, while you were speaking Kevin um, uh, and if anyone has any questions and uh, questions that you would like an answer to, uh, we'll try our best. <laughs> um, you could just stick it in the Q and A box there. So um, the one that came in, um, Maya, it uh, says this is a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, can you recommend any literature for a parent of an autistic person, and any appropriate reading for a teenager? Um, well, many, many thanks. That depends if, if you're looking specifically for literature that's about um, relationships and sexuality um, or more in general. Um, so actually literature on sexuality, there isn't that much out there. Um, there, is a, there is a survival guide um, on autism and sexuality 
can't actually remember who wrote it right now. Gosh, that's that's probably bad. Um, <laughs> I, I know that it's out there. I know that it's out there. Um, about autism in general, I mean, there's so much, but I may have one myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so right now it's self-published, but it's actually in the process of being um, rewritten and edited for Jessica, Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Um, so that might be out later this year. The current um, self-published version, which will be taken down once uh, we get to the finishing stages of re-releasing it, um, it is called what your child with Asperger's wants you to know and how you can help. Um, and that is written specifically for parents um, and consists of a bunch of very short chapters. So it's, it's easy to get through um, and, and easy to get started with. Um, but that's if you want more general sort of, and that's appropriate for teenagers as well. I have had parents come back to me and said that they, they gave it to their child to read and, and that their, their teenager um, greatly appreciated it. So it's written for parents, but apparently it's good for teenagers too, um, mm. is the feedback that I'm getting. Um, generally, gosh, there's just so much literature yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And another one that I've uh, heard about um, from people in the community is there's a book called The Autism Spectrum Guide to Sexuality and Relationships. Yes. Understand Yourself and Make Choices That Are Right for You by Dr. Emma Goodall. Um, I've heard from some people that it's too technical and technical. I've heard from some people that it's not technical and technical enough for their um, things. So my understanding is it, that means it's probably a good middle ground that's perfectly readable. It's just that we can be very particular. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. Um, we have another question here that either of you could answer really. I was just saying that your seven year old, uh, seven, 17 year old is worried about not being in a relationship. Is there any, uh, give any advice or wisdom around that topic? Chill. Uh, chill yeah. <laughs> don't worry it'll happen <laughs> as a man who's just become single for the first like long amount of time in six years savor it <laughs> Save, yeah. <laughs> savor it yeah, yeah. You're, you're beholden to no one right now but yourself and you shouldn't um rush into things that you think that you want um until you're positive about how it will work out and it's not about, oh, I should be in a relationship because that's not how you should be thinking. What you should be thinking is, oh, I can make new friends, meet new people. Maybe I can meet somebody who is interesting. But it's not the approach of, oh, I'm looking for someone to date. It's, oh, I'm going to expand my social circle and see if there might be more opportunities there. That's my yeah. opinion anyway. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that. Um, and, and also just to know that you're 17 yeah relax you know <laughs> life life does not end when you hit 20 no, I promise you um, I promise it you. doesn't it doesn't end when you hit 25 either <laughs> or 30 um you trust know, me just, there was a few uh there was a few tense moments on the just, 14th of October last year but uh yes just, I can guarantee that you live past 20 <laughs> you do and you live past 30 too um yeah I'm I'm gonna be 35 this year so you know, still alive, still yeah. very much kicking. Um, yes. Yeah, just relax. Gosh. Um, and also just know that you're going to develop so much as a person um, emotionally and your maturity and also what you're looking for. It's going to mature so much over the next five to 10 years. Let that happen. And as Kevin said, expand your social circle. Yes, go for that. Um, but looking for a relationship specifically usually ends badly. Um, mm. That that usually is is not a good way. Yeah, to the, the, that can be depressing. The better way to look at it is that you're looking yeah. to be more social in general yeah. and expand your social circle. Yeah. You might yeah. make wonderful friends that you'll have for the rest of your life, 
I know that some of the people that are some of my closest friends are people who I went on dates with in my first year of college, <laughs> you know, and yeah, now yeah. there's absolutely no romantic thing there. They're just wonderful friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as I, as I said in, in my talk as well, you know, don't be depressed about ending up in the friend zone. Be thankful for making friends that are great mm. and awesome people. Um, that's, that's really what you're, and, and, just to add one thing, I get it. I, I get how desperate the feeling of, I need to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend or just a, a romantic partner in general. I, that desire makes so much sense. And it's, it's, it's valid that you're mm -hmm. having those feelings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please try to relax. Yes. You're gonna be fine. Exactly. It'll happen. <laughs> um, You're also not alone. It's not your autism, trust me. No. I know mm, plenty of mm. your typical 17 year olds that don't have yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> Plenty. Exactly. <laughs> um, I hope I don't butcher this word here. It says, uh, hello, Maya. You mentioned allarrhythmia there earlier, and I hadn't heard of it before. When you said uh, what you said about it really resonated with me. Is it just a general symptom of autism? And do you have any advice on how to deal with it? Um, it's alexithymia. Sorry, uh, yeah. alexithymia. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible. Yeah, at so <laughs> alexithymia is it, it's not something that is everyone on the autistic spectrum deals with this. Um, it's something that many have difficulties with, and in general words that relate to emotions can be difficult. So the way to go about alexithymia is really talk to your child about different nuances of different emotions. Talk to them about how do they feel in your body? How does it feel to be nervous, for example? How does it feel to be sad or angry or happy or all of these things? And how do different nuances of those emotions feel? And can we put words to them? That will help expand sort of their ability to identify their own emotions and then talk about them. It's going that to is. take a long time you know, just, it, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to yeah, give them that, a dictionary and then they get it. Um, yeah, that is how my parents helped me to get a handle on uh, what emotions feel like of just getting me to talk it out mm -hmm. slowly over time. It took a few years, yeah. but we got there. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Talk to your child. <laughs> talk, to him, um... talk to the person you're concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Sorry, I'm just trying to pick a question. You guys feel free to go through the Q&A box and pick out um, any questions. There was actually one at the uh, n near the bottom that I was... Uh, yeah. Um, so first of all, um, yes, I was aware of some spectrum before the topic of puberty uh, and my parents' suggestions the subject came up. Um, for a guy, I was diagnosed kind of late, but for the average um, community, I wasn't really. I was diagnosed at eight years old through the private system because we've been on the public system for, God, I think two, two, two and a half years waiting. So we went through the well, private system. Um, and there was another one uh, just really quickly that I thought I had a, um, the, the, uh, Pamela, I think it was, uh, hey, I'm 20 years old, currently in college, and I was wondering how someone like me could start a relationship during COVID-19. Um, a, my answer to that is don't be in too much of a rush to start a relationship during COVID-19, because that typically means you can't meet the person, and getting into a relationship with somebody that you haven't met before can be problematic and difficult. I've been in that situation. I had a four-month-long, like, long-distance relationship with a girl in London, um, not perfectly ideal, uh, that fell apart for its own reasons. But um, what I would say is if you genuinely feel like you want to date or whatever, or get to know people during COVID, which I find a lot of people have wanted to, um, a lot of my friends have wanted to, a lot of people are feeling quite lonely. Um, those dating apps may not be your thing, but there are tons of them. 
And there are tons of different ones with different ways of engaging communication. Like Bumble, only women can start the conversation um, after a match. Like uh, Timey is specifically for, Timey is designed to be Tinder, but all inclusive and allowing, um, you know, any, uh, like you can input your own sexuality and gender identity. Um, just, just, just relax. Just chat to the people. If they, if you're having a nice time talking to them, maybe you can do a phone call or a watch party or something. That's my advice for that. Mm-hmm. Just, 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 just socialize with them. Don't be like, I need to be in a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw that there was a question about advice for polyamorous romantic and sexual relationships. Um, this is not something I have experience with myself, but I do have friends who, who are. And communication, um, mm. you know, talk about your boundaries, talk about what, you, what you're okay with, um, talk about what you're not okay with. And, and really just communication is key always. And uh, being open and honest about what you want um, and what you're okay with and what you're not is the thing that's going to lead to the best results for everyone involved. Mm, yeah, uh, I have had some experience with polyamorous relationships and the answer that uh, I gave is absolutely, yeah, it's, it's, it's talking. It's mm. talking the whole way along. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where uh, information symmetry is the um, is the bona fide best way for anything like that to work. Everyone knows the same. Um, learn the terminology, learn uh, a bit about the community, and then everyone has to know exactly what's going on with everyone. Whether uh, like in my experience. If someone said, oh, I want to be involved with you, but I don't want to know about anything else. That's typically a red flag out the wazoo of that's definitely not something worth pursuing because that can only lead to jealousy, confusion, misunderstanding. Um, so communication. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll probably take one or two more questions. Uh, one just came in there about consent. So what's the best way to introduce the topic of consent? Um, is seven or eight years old too early? Uh, it's not, it's never too early to talk about consent. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, really talking about and, and teaching your children that their bodily autonomy matters is, is necessary. Now the, the tea and consent video that I mentioned earlier, there is a version for children as well. Um, so if you search for tea and consent on YouTube, the children's version will pop up and yeah, it, it's there. I've watched it. It's great. And for a seven or eight year old that it will work. Um, yeah. So, and honestly, all of the questions that have to do with how do you broach this topic? How do you start talking about this? Talk about it like it's normal, you know? Honestly, I feel like one of the biggest problems that we have as a society when it comes to sex, when it comes to identity, when it comes to all of these things, is that we're so scared of these topics. And if we talk about them like they are normal human things, then they're not so scary. Um, You know, talking to your child about sexuality or about masturbation or about consent or all of these things, they're just normal human things that people do. It's not something scary. It's, you know, so as a parent, you teach your child how to cook, how to clean, how to budget, and you talk to them about how relationships work and how sexuality um, functions and, and how it's okay to be with people. And, and you talk to them about their boundaries and all of these things. It's just normal human behavior. It's not scary. Don't treat it like it is. Yeah. Um, Let me take just one last one. One came in there just at the end. Um, It says, um, my 15 year old wants to know why she keeps falling in love with fictional characters. Now this is quite common, I feel anyway, especially for teenagers. Um, Have you guys got any answers to this? My 15 year old's here with me. (laughs) Are there any reasons behind it as a 
probably for a psychological oh, well, view or something. <laughs> well, my first great love was Indiana Jones, so. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Edward Cullen um, when I was a kid. <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And the thing about fictional characters is that they're very often written by authors who are in love with these characters themselves, mm, not definitely. in terms of romantic, I want to be with this person love, but there, there is that fascination and that, mm. that deep sort of, oh, this person would be amazing to know, or they're so interesting. And, and that sort of fascination, the authors yeah. have that fascination as well. So when they write that characters or, or when, when these characters are portrayed in, in movies or, or, TV series or wherever else we, we get to know these characters, we're getting to know them through that lens of mm. that passion and that mm. interest, that, that deep fascination that comes from the author as well. Um, so it, it's completely normal and natural to, when you're exposed to that, it, um, it's contagious. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Yeah. I love this so much. I'm I, I'm an English literature student, so. Um, <laughs> but this should have been your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no no no! It's I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, another aspect of it that I have actually found and kind of studied. Um, I'm actually doing a module on love and literature at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, when we see these characters, especially from an artistic point of view, um, or what is called the general artist point of view, but is actually, you know, a normal human being's like diverse uh, view. Um, this is actually a, uh, characters are two and a half dimensional, not three dimensional in mm. books. Um, they, everything they do, if it's a good character, should relate to a logical consequence of the story, the plot, etc. Even their emotional reactions are logical consequences of what's going on and those are quite often their responses are the things that we preempt as a reader um, while we are reading which is fascinating because that means that you are preempting the response a character might have you feel like you have come to know this character on a personal deep level because you have you have their inner monologue in front of you yeah. it's it's written out in black and white it's it's right there there's no guessing there's no messiness and there's no random, illogical, dumb action that has no explanation on the page. Yeah. And for, for, for us, or at least for me, um, knowing every single time that uh, he's going to save the day, she's going to sort this out, this fight out with her friend, she's going to do it like this, this is how she's feeling. Um, that's the only people that I know more intimately than my favorite intimate character, uh, than my favorite uh, l l like characters in fiction, the only people that I know more intimately are people who I have been in long-term relationships with, which probably explains why there's a connection between the two, <laughs> you know, of, <laughs> of, of appreciation and attraction. Can I, can I add one thing as well? Um, mm. Just because Nicola, you mentioned Edward Cullen. Um, it, it's, it's actually quite interesting to me is that very often when we read books that are romantic fiction that are written from um, a, a first person perspective, the main character whose thoughts we're reading are written in a way that makes them very much a self-insert character. So mm -hmm. when, you are, when you're reading the book, you experience the book through this character's eyes. And so the person that they fall in love with in the book you fall in love with too, because they're in a monologue becomes you're in a monologue because you're reading it. Mm. Um, so, so those self-insert characters that we see ourselves as, we end up having, having thoughts and wishes on their behalf as well, which exactly. is also why people reading, for example, the Twilight Saga, there was very much a team Edward and a team, um, because the one no, that you no, relate yeah. to personally is yeah, the exactly. one to have <laughs> the Jacob. positive response. Uh, yeah, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that was the one. I know to most slipped. <laughs> um, the one that, uh, that, 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 that I find catches me out, and this is partly because being a literature student, I love a lot of the classics. So um, I find myself, when I am reading The Lord of the Rings, 
in the first book, Aragorn is a strange, mysterious person who doesn't actually have an awful lot of genuine explanation of his backstory, his understandings. Um, in the second book, you read from Eowyn's perspective a lot. Eowyn is falling in love with Aragorn in these segments. I found myself starting to have more romantic feelings for Aragorn when I was constantly reading about how amazing he was and attractive mm -hmm. and, you know, um, like a chisel jawline and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's something that it, I'm reading the words on the page and they're yeah. entering my subconscious mm -hmm. as like, oh, actually, now that you mention it, yeah, that is a thing mm -hmm. that I think about this character, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How could you not love them? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that, is, that is why loving fictional characters is, is such a general thing. That yeah, it's we all so, do. Yeah. so common. <laughs> yeah. It's um, why I spent the majority of my time in secondary school on Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, guys. That was, uh, that was really enjoyable. And I really um, hope I don't speak for myself, but I learned a lot from both speakers tonight. Um, it was really great. So just a reminder to everyone that this will be available as a recording on YouTube from tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to share it with any friends or anyone who didn't get a chance to log on this evening. So do keep an eye out on our social media for updates on that. And um, so yeah, that's goodbye for another uh -huh. few weeks. Uh, thank you very yeah. much, guys. I hope you my have a lovely just, evening. Oh, awesome. I was just saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking through the Q&As and my brain is just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what you, I did the yeah. same thing. It's a mistake. Don't, don't do it. We'll be here all night. Don't do it. Don't you do would it. be yes, here, all, be here night. all night. I could, <laughs> I could we'll talk. be here tomorrow, too. And exactly. Kind of <laughs> I could talk till my lecture starts tomorrow morning about all of this. <laughs> um, yes. Uh,